Hallo. Hi. That's me a long time ago. I don't know how I got from there to here. When I grew up, I thought I was going to be a housewife. You know, I think everybody in my generation thought they were going to grow up to be housewives. But a lot changed over the years. And not only was I interested in art, but also in fashion or costumes. <laughs> and I also had a penchant for organizing my friends to do various activities, like maybe parades down the street, or <laughs> you know, just anything to keep us occupied with something interesting. Over the years, I had a lot of great teachers. My parents, my mom, basically taught me to sew by taking out the stitching when it didn't go well. My dad has a passion for computers and engineering and just a curiosity about a lot of things in the world. My grandparents taught me about plants and gardens and sewing and words by playing Scrabble with me for hours on end. You know, my brothers, I learned about getting along or not getting along with other people. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Isley, my 11th grade English teacher, answered the question, why would the prince want to trade place with the pauper? And the, his answer was because he wanted to be worldly. And so that became one of my life missions, to become worldly. Miss Abbas read us a story at the end of every day. If we got our work done on time, one of my very favorite stories was Onion John. It's a good read, even for adults. And I, a guy named Donald Knuth taught me to do the Towers of to Hanoi, which is a puzzle by not telling me anything but asking me questions which I had to figure out the answers to. And I've learned from a lot of other people along the way as well. Technology, you know. Um, I lived a bunch of places, mostly in university towns. And I traveled a few places when I was young, 48 states and a few other countries. And then I went to college, make a short story long or a long story short. And when I went to college, I decided to study. Well, I don't know if I decided to study, because everybody in my family studied math and computer science, OK? It was the only subject acceptable to be studying. And <laughs> <laughs> so I, got, I, I went to school for a couple of years, and I got a job as a programmer. And I figured, who needs college? I'm making good money already. So I quit college. Well, that lasted for a whole year. And then I went back and took classes in theater. And when I studied theater, I learned to paint scenery and design scenery and design costumes and even do some special effects, like making a sword rise out of a column of fire or a book glow. And I made some puppets. And I learned a lot in the theater. Some of the things I learned are in the left-hand column, and those are softer skills, OK? They're like how to work on a team, how to get along with other people, how to take responsibility, how to meet deadlines. And others are more tangible skills, like how to use power saws and build things and use electricity and some stuff about sound and lots of other subjects. They've come in very handy over the years, all these subjects. And then I moved to New York City. I had a one-way bus ticket two suitcases, my portfolio, and a tackle box full of art supplies. And I lived there for nearly a decade working in the theater. I designed costumes. I designed sets. I built models for set pieces that other people constructed for performances. I built armor for the New York Shakespeare Festival, 58 suits in this case for Henry V, I think it was, in the park. I built other things like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> and here you see me sculpting legs. These legs became the legs of He-Man. Whoops, that's volume. Whoops, go backwards, that's He-Man and Skeletor. These characters went to various Kmarts and other kinds of department stores to shake hands with young children who were fans of the cartoons. Um, when I went to the store to buy the latex to build them out of, the guy said, what are you going to use this for? And I told him. And he said, oh, I don't think it'll work for that. I said, well, I kind of think it will. So I'm going to buy it anyway. And then I brought back pictures. And he's like, oh, well, I guess it did work. <laughs> um, I, this is me sculpting a head of Daffy Duck, which was for a dance performance. 
buy Mattel toys or something like, you know, Disney on Ice, except it was just on a stage. And I built some more puppets. This was for an H.O. Oats commercial. And I built a few things for the Saturday Night Live Extinct Species Fashion Show. <laughs> and then I took a job with a dance company. The dance company is called Jennifer Muller in the Works. I'm very fond of their work. Um, for the most part, Jennifer does not like to perform in the United States, although she does sometimes at the Joyston City Center. But she really liked performing in other countries. This is one of the pieces in the repertory called Tub. Um, there was a lot of water involved in, in addition to dancers. And uh, so I had the great privilege of being able to travel with her for several years and travel to a lot of different countries. So you now you look at this whole list of countries and I had people working for me in all these countries and you say, well, can you really speak all those languages? No. <laughs> but our impresario said, I, I was worried about this issue and he said, don't worry about it. He says, you speak French? Well, I sort of speak, spoke French. I had to study it in high school. He says, no problem. Just speak French with a Spanish accent. People will understand you. <laughs> Italy, no problem. Same deal. And somehow it did work out. Somehow I managed. Um, this is one example of a costume I designed for Jennifer's solo performance with music by Jean-Luc Ponty. She liked uh, jazz musicians as her composers. And this is uh, another piece that I designed well, actually, I designed it in New York, and then we were on the road. We were the premier dance company at the Avignon Dance Festival one year. And uh, so I had to completely redesign it while we were in the south of France and shop all these secondhand clothing stores. It was a lot of fun. So after I'd done theater for about a decade, I decided to, um, thanks to some architects who said, well, geez, computer science and theater, good combination to do computer graphics. So I went to graduate school in computer graphics and animation. And when I went to visit the facility where I would later be a student, they were building really simple things. Uh, <laughs> they were building a few things that were somewhat more complicated than this, but mostly coming to it as a scenic artist, I said, where's the dirt? Because I had spent the last 10 years of my life painting dirt onto everything and painting peeling plaster when I was painting scenery. And I really think that comment is what got me into grad school. It was wonderful, <laughs> just asking about dirt. But at that time, there was no commercial software to do computer graphics with. Now there are lots of options in terms of computer software. And so in order to build this simple object, we had to type in the XYZ coordinates for each vertex in the object. And then we had to type in the order of the points that should be connected together to build every face in the object. Why in the world did we think it was a good idea? But really, when I look back on it, I have no idea. But we did. We saw potential, I guess. I think that's what it was really about. And gradually, we built tools that made it easier to do some of these things. In the beginning, we could only assign a single color to each face of the object. And then we got to where we could put texture maps on things so that a cube could become a child's block or a building or presence. And, um, as the years went on, the, the work got more and more detailed. I'm not going to show you a lot of the work that I did in those days. I'll just describe briefly. I worked for a small production company while I was in grad school, and I did the ABC and CBS station identifications for all across the country. Um, did a lot of commercials, did a lot of scientific research. We did one of the first uh, passes at sewing together slices of the brain to create a model of the brain, etc. Um, but I've also, I also kind of went back to grad school because I had in mind that I might want to teach. So over the years, I have, well, I've been teaching for more than 25 years now computer graphics. And I've designed curriculum for eight different computer graphics programs at different universities. And I've used more than 40 3D programs. And that's just the 3D programs. It doesn't include the 2D programs <laughs> or the video editing programs or any of those. And um, I still like it. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. I still enjoy it. So the next thing I'm going to show you is an image that was created just to give you some perspective from where I came from in my first couple of weeks in school to what a student can do in two weeks nowadays. Okay? 
This is a still life that was created by one of my students this quarter. And it was in the second week of the quarter. Okay, so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, come on over. You can join one of my classes. Uh, I think it's quite beautiful. And that's in two weeks. And then another, I have a bunch of one-week assignments in this beginning class. And so another assignment, we use a tutorial where you create a hand. And so I said, okay, take the hand and create a landscape out of the hand by using multiple copies of the hand. And this is what one student came up with. I'll walk back and forth so you can see. Can you see all the hands in there? Lots and lots of hands. The ground and the trees and everything. Um, <clears throat> Another assignment I get is to build an interior space, and I ask students to use a photographic reference for that. And this, I get a, give them a couple of weeks to do it, one to build the geometry, and another one to put all the surfaces on and light the geometry. And this is the kind of result that I get. Okay. Now, I give students a complete control over what kind of room they build. So this is a student who chose this particular venue, but. I have a lot of students who are medical illustrators, so one of the medical illustrators chose this instead. Um, that way it gives everybody a lot of flexibility in, in terms of choosing something to do that they enjoy or that is meaningful to them. I also teach a character animation class, and so we build the characters, which means we build the geometry for the characters, and then we put muscles and bones inside of them, and then we move them and hope that the geometry does not tear apart. So this is one example of the kind of character that my students design. <laughs> uh, now I teach sometimes a lighting class. Uh, turns out an orange is a tough thing to light because you want to get the feeling of that oily surface on the orange, and that's not something that's terribly easy to do in computer graphics. So that's most generally the first assignment that I give. <laughs> the geometry is easy. Um, and then sometimes we want to make images look like something besides photoreal situations, you know? Not that the hands were photographically realistic, but um, so we paint textures to put on objects so that it looks more like the images or the image came from a painting rather than from a photograph. We've also done a lot of projects collaborating with other people. Here's one example. This is a building, an art center. I think now I've never actually seen the building in person. Um, it was all boarded up and the city was going to renovate it and they wanted to get some images of what it was going to look like, so we, we did that. And uh, there's a public garden. I assume it, it actually happened. I don't know. We just built the model. Um, down the street from the public market. And so we based the design of the gates to the public garden off the gates from the public market. We've also done some research with... Uh, Imaging scientists at RIT, uh, several different projects, but I'm going to show you one. This is to build some curriculum for community colleges across the country to learn optics when they don't have optics facilities like we have at RIT. So we did, this is just a still image, you can see the animation online, but we built an animation of how different kinds of lenses work and how different simple, simple optical systems work. <coughs> I also got a grant to um, work with a company that was doing some work for Gleason Works, and we built a <coughs> simulation of one of the machines that they manufacture to go into a factory. So that's all work that I've done with the students in my program, but I sometimes work with students in other programs as well. So in this case, I worked with three students from engineering, and I said, um, I'd really like an animatronic dog <coughs> that I don't have to walk or feed. <laughs> and um, this is what they built for me. That's the inside of it, okay? And in the lower right, she's dressed for Halloween. <laughs> um, I'm working on some new projects this quarter, but I don't have images from them yet. And mostly my students are working on these projects because RIT encourages us really strongly to get our students involved in our, in our uh, scholarly work. Um, so we, we build and design game levels and generally working with uh, students in the game development program in the IT department. And we're doing accident reconstruction from an accident that a lawyer provided the data for from the Buffalo area. That's very interesting. 
and we're doing some simulations of some surgery. So we're doing blood and guts. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> Very interesting. So only certain people volunteer for that project. Um, we're also getting more and more involved in tangible interfaces where we use other kinds of things besides mice and keyboard to interface with the computer, like motion sensors, light sensors, proximity sensors, foot pedals, etc. And we have a new facility where we can do immersive worlds where you have projections from several directions so you're surrounded by image that's coordinated so you feel like you're in a totally other, other space. But my particular personal research is in virtual theater. So what we're doing with virtual theater is we're creating performances, theatrical performances on virtual stages in real time. So it's not a movie because it's not canned, it's not animation, it's in real time. The very first performance that we did about five years ago, we had a single node motion capture system. Well, you can't really control a human being with one point in space. So instead, we controlled a bee, which then became a swarm of bees, thanks to Joe Geigel, who you can meet out in the hall, and his students. Um, <clears throat> was it, was it a, a wonderful piece of theater? No. <laughs> <laughs> some things worked, some things didn't work. And, um, but we all learned a lot. It is research. It is kind of on the bleeding edge of things, right? So the next year, we got a full body motion capture system. And being the conservative people that we are, we decided to have six human characters controlled by this one mocap system in this elaborate performance where it appeared to be motion picture film and everything was in black and white. And do you think it worked as theater? No. <laughs> but again, we learned a lot. So the next year, we created a script that had one human character controlled by our mocap system. Uh, I have one minute. Uh, and it went a lot better. It wasn't still perfect, but it went a lot better. And then we did a piece with some people from Utah where we had live actors videotaped on Utah and computer animated characters in Rochester combined together with editing software created by somebody in Cardiff, Wales. Here's a couple of examples. People are from Utah. The animated characters are from Rochester. And this is our latest production, which was a vaudeville show. And the red curtains on the bottom are audience clients, where the people are watching the performance on their computers. And you see images of the two motion capture systems. Our next project will be a talent show. And now I'm just going to talk about a few things that are important to me relative to all of my work. One is. Um, that I think you have to use the right and left side of your brain. So I love this quote from, um, yeah, he's looking over my shoulder, Einstein, about how music played an important role in his discoveries. Um, I think science and design have a lot of things in common in terms of you can come up with a problem and come up with an answer, and the answer can be correct, but if you didn't ask the right question to begin with, you get the wrong answer. And you get the wrong answer in design, and you get the wrong answer in science. They have a lot in common. Um, you learn when you want to know. So if you want somebody to learn something, you have to find a way to motivate them to care about what they're learning. When you're a teacher, the, mind, the medium that you're working in is the mind. And I don't mean like a cultish thing, but you're trying to open people's ideas and minds to new ideas and creative thinking. And you should always ask questions that you don't know the answers to, because that's what leads students to be innovative and creative, instead of questions that you do know the answer to. And last but not least, if a boulder falls into the middle of a stream and blocks the water, the water will find a way around. Right? So when you find an obstacle in your life, think of water. OK. Thank you, Marla.